Hey y'all, Coach and Fight here, talking about the day of the Lord and the day that the sky cracked. In this video, I'm going to show you why it is that nobody knows the day or the hour, and then I'm going to show you exactly when that day and hour was. That's right, I said was. So, stay tuned. Now, the first place we want to start is over in Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 through 14. This prophecy of Daniel is actually pointing to the day of the Lord. I'm not the first to understand this, as we're going to see here in a second. But let me go ahead and read it. It says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the day of sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? You see there in verse 14, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, this verse may seem familiar to many of you guys, especially people who are aware of the Millerites. William Miller, back in the 1800s, used this verse to predict the end of the world in 1843. You're looking here at an article which appears to be in some type of newspaper from that time period. He goes into great detail, pointing out Daniel's vision as well as John's vision to get the understanding of what would happen on that day. He may have gotten the events correct, but he got the year wrong. And let me show you how. You see here a timeline from that period starting in about 465 BC and going to about 457 BC. It was in about 457 BC when the third decree came to build the temple. And it was that date that William Miller used to calculate the day of the Lord or the end of the world, as he called it. You see here that simply by adding 2,300 years to the year 457 BC, you end up in 1843. And this is how William Miller and many other people around the world came up with the idea that our Messiah would be returning in 1843. If you study what they call the Great Disappointment, you'll find how big a deal this was back during that time. But it's called the Great Disappointment because nothing happened in 1843. Thousands of people had quit their jobs and burned their money, sold their houses in anticipation of this day in 1843, but they were all disappointed. And let me show you why. On closer inspection of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13, you can see that it is not the decree that was to be the start of this 2300 years, but it was the daily sacrifice. Let's come over to the book of Ezra, chapter 6. Looking at verse 15, it says, And his house was finished on the third day of the month Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. So it was in the twelfth month during the sixth year of the reign of King Darius that the house was finished. And a quick search on the web tells us that Darius II's reign started in 423 B.C., so his sixth year would have been in 417 BC. This is when the daily sacrifice had been started back. You remember it was taken away by King Nebuchadnezzar back in 605 BC when he took all of the golden utensils and put them in the house of his gods back there in Shinar. So no daily sacrifice had taken place from 605 BC until what we see here in Ezra chapter 6. 15 and verse 16, when the children of Israel and the priests and the Levites and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of the house of God with joy. So after almost 200 years, they had once again started the daily sacrifice. And that's what Daniel was talking about back in chapter 8 and verse 13, when he's asking how long shall be the vision of the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation. So if William Miller had a did his calculation from 417 instead of 457, he and everybody else would have anticipated the return of our Messiah in 1883. Now, that still would have been a year too early because you have to remember that there was no year zero. So 2,300 years from the return of the daily sacrifice 
takes you to actually 1884. This should have been the year of that great day of anticipation. But now another thing that he got wrong was that he thought it would be the end of the world. Daniel doesn't say the end of the world. He says that the sanctuary would be cleansed. John never said that it would be the end of the world either. You see in Revelation chapter 19, where in verse 12, he's talking about the return of our Messiah, having eyes as the flame of fire and on his head many crowns. But you see there, he says, and he had a name written that no man knew. He's talking about the return of the Messiah coming in a way that nobody would really recognize him. That's what it means by a name written that no man knew. But if you look in the very next verse, he tells you what that name is. It says, and he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood and his name was called the word of God. So William Miller was anticipating the end of the world, but what he should have been anticipating was the word of God. So now these many years later, we can correct what William Miller was anticipating, understanding that it wasn't the end of the world in 1843, but it was the word of God in 1884. So let's see where it came. Now, we always want to let the scripture define itself. So let me read a verse for you. It says, do you remember that cloud in which my disciples saw me ascend? the last time that I manifested myself to them. In truth, it was written that I would come again in a cloud and this I have fulfilled. This is talking about the return of Christ and how we have been always told that he would return on a cloud. He says that this has been fulfilled. He goes on to talk about the date of Rosh Hashanah. There's a bit of a translation error here. The S-E-P-T in September means seven. So it's talking about the first day of the seventh month. But what it says is on the first day of September in 1866, my spirit came in a symbolic cloud to prepare you to receive my new lesson. And we're going to get to 1866 in a minute. But look here, it says later in 1884, I began to give you my new teachings. So. With all that we've learned so far about the return of Christ, the return of the word of God being in 1884, well, this is it. That's what he means by his new teachings. This is coming from chapter two, the dawn of the third era. This comes out of the third testament of the Bible, the third part of the trilogy. This is the scripture that was given to mankind as we enter a new phase of our existence. Just like back when Moses was helping the people transition to a new era, they got scripture, the Old Testament. And when the Messiah ushered in the next era, he brought the New Testament. Now that we're getting ready for the kingdom age, our father has once again presented himself in the form of the word of God to give us instruction for that period. And we know that as the third testament of the Bible. In verse six of chapter two, it says, I did not arrive as a man, but rather spiritually contained in a ray of light to dwell within human understanding. This is the means chosen by my will to speak to you in this era. And I will take into account the faith that you deposit in this word. Talking about those of us who put faith in the scripture, particularly this third testament of the Bible, whereas there are many people expecting the Messiah to come back as a human or in some form that they can lay eyes on. Well, it is the third testament of the Bible that we're supposed to be laying our eyes on because that was again, just like in the New Testament or the Second Testament is the way our Messiah has returned. This time it's not as the word being turned into a human, but he says he returns spiritually. We shouldn't be surprised as the Messiah told us that this would be the case in John chapter four, verses 22 and 23, when he said, ye worship, ye know not what? We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. He was explaining to the Samaritan woman that she didn't understand who the father truly was. 
He goes on to say in verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him. So just like the third Testament was telling us he would return spiritually. Well, the truth part is the third Testament of the Bible. So there is your spirit and truth in the third Testament of the Bible. It's the truth that teaches us how to be spiritual beings. But I don't expect you to take my word for it. So let's go on to prove it. The most biblically astute among us when thinking on the return of Christ in 1884 will think on Revelation chapter 6, which were the events that were supposed to lead up to the return of Christ. You see there in verse 12, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So before the coming of Christ, we should be able to point back to a great earthquake. If the Messiah returned in 1884, when was this great earthquake that we hear about in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12? The answer is Krakatoa, 1883. That's the day that the sky cracked, just like he said it would. Now, Krakatoa has always been seen as one of the most catastrophic events in human history. Well, we're going to see here in a second that it is actually the day of the Lord. Let's take a closer look. I found this chart over on Google simply by doing a search in the images for the Krakatoa timeline. And we see here that it was in May of 1883 that the first explosion was heard there in Indonesia. This wasn't the biggest event in Krakatoa. It was just the first. And it started on the 20th of May, 1883. Well, let me show you what that date corresponds to. I'm over here at hebcal.com and I'm looking at the Jewish calendar from 1883. If you know me, you know that I checked these dates myself and the Jewish community got it right in 1883. So let's scroll down to May and let's see what was going on in May. When we're looking on this calendar for May of 1883, looking at the 21st, we see what I think is pronounced as Pesachini. Well, when we click on it, we see that this was actually second Passover of the year 1883. So it was in 1883 before our Messiah returned as the word of God. Just like he said, the sky began to crack on second Passover in 1883. You remember that all of our father's feast days starts the evening before? Well, it was during the time when those who had missed first Passover should have been partaking in second Passover, heard a great explosion coming from Jakarta, followed by heavy ashfall. But this was only the start. You see, this kind of went on almost the whole entire week of what it should have been the Feast of Unleavened Bread following second Passover. And right there at the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they started hearing explosions. And even though the activity of the volcano had waned a little bit there in the middle of the week, well, here on the 27th, you see that all of the trees were made leafless. Yep, they got burned up. So how was that for a start? It gets more intense after that. After second Passover ended, you see there was a decline in activity, but then it started to smoke again around June the 1st. And a great explosion was heard on June the 19th. Now, you can't make this stuff up. If you understand our father's feast days, you could probably almost guess what was going on on June the 19th of 1883. In fact, when we subtract 50 days from June the 19th of 1883, we end up on Monday, April the 30th of 1883. So what was the significance of April the 30th, 1883? That's actually the date of first fruits. The feast that starts right after the Feast of Unleavened Bread and starts the Feast of Weeks when we are supposed to count 50 days. Well, those that were counting those 50 days 
from the Feast of First Fruits in 1883, understanding the 2300 day prophecy given by Daniel would have been completely taken aback when there was another huge explosion there on the true date of Pentecost in the year 1883. So if we're keeping track, you had the beginning on second Passover of 1883 with one of the major events happening there at the end of the second Feast of Unleavened Bread there in 1883, followed by another huge event there on Pentecost of 1883. And it was shortly thereafter that we see that the whole mountain fell into the ocean on June the 24th of 1883. And there toward the end of June, you had what they describe as the loudest explosion this explosion was heard 3,000 miles away. I'm sure after this, many of you guys are going to look up Krakatoa. And what you're going to find is there in about the 11th and the 12th of August of 1883, about a third of the trees were burnt up and about a third of the grass was burnt up. So what's the significance of the 11th and the 12th of August of 1883? Coming back to the Jewish calendar for 1883, we see that August the 12th was Tisha B'Av, which is the 10th of Av, and August the 11th was the 9th of Av. Tisha B'Av is the fast of the fifth month. That's the date in which we commemorate or remember the time in which Nebuchadnezzar came into Babylon and burned Solomon's temple to the ground. We see that in Jeremiah chapter 52, verses 12 through 13. So while many people around the world would have been celebrating the fast of the fifth month or remembering the destruction of the temple, that's the time over in Indonesia when this volcano was at one of its most active points, throwing much ash and debris into the air and creating dark clouds that covered much of the world. So there in August, beginning on Tisha B'Av, was the beginning of the climax of Krakatoa. You see there in late August that the trees and the grass continued to be burnt up. Well, one of the things that you find out that happened is that this volcano created a shockwave that went around the earth three times. Yep, that would have been your sky rolling away like a scroll. That shockwave, three times. Just in case you missed it the first time, it went around the world three times. And to this date has been the loudest sound heard on this planet. And I also wanted to add that considering the position of Jerusalem and Krakatoa, the blast wave, initial one at least, would have went from the east to the west, just like in the book. In August of 1883, the sky cracked, producing black clouds that put the planet in darkness for five years. Yep, the scripture says that the sunlight and the moonlight would be disrupted. For five years, these people were under an ash cloud, making it so that they couldn't grow crops, which explains why the scripture is written that way, because even though this event happened in Indonesia, people around the world would have felt and saw the sky crack and they would have saw the sun and the moon go dark for five years. And you could imagine, I don't see it written here, but you could imagine that this huge volcano that pushed half of the mountain into the ocean would have created other earthquakes that would have been felt around the world. And many people would have experienced the tsunami that it created that was three times bigger than a tsunami that knocked over the Fukushima nuclear plant. So let's come back over and let's look at Revelation chapter six, when it's talking about the sixth seal. We said that we was gonna come back to this 1866 that we read about over in the third testament of the Bible. Well, down in chapter 38 of the third testament of the Bible, there is a section called the seven seals of sacred history, which goes on to explain to us what the seals were and when they were opened. This passage 
will end much of the debate over when and what the six seals are. It tells us there that the first one was opened back there with Abel, and the second one was opened back there with Noah. That would have been the red seal when the peace was taken from the earth. That's why when you look at that movie that they created about Noah, it has so much violence in it. You see that the third stage was represented by Jacob, talking about how he had to go into Egypt. That's the black seal when for the first time humans had to pay to eat before then people grew their own food but it was in egypt that joseph started selling corn and humans have been paying to eat ever since those seals never close just like the fourth seal was with moses which represented the law the fifth seal was ushered in by our messiah the divine word the sacrificial lamb. Just like with Moses, we learn to live within the law. Well, with the Messiah, we learn to live in love. Then we get down to verse 49 of chapter 38, which is talking about the sixth seal. It says the sixth seal is represented by Elijah. He is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. It is he who goes on his chariot of fire, bringing light to all the nations and all the worlds that are unknown to you, but known to me. For I am the father of all the worlds and all the creatures. This is the stage in which you are living, that of Elijah. It is his light that illuminates you. He represents the teachings that were hidden, but that are being revealed to mankind in this era. When we do a search in the Third Testament for 1866, we find that this Elijah returned in 1866. That was the beginning of the Sixth Seal. In 1866, that invisible door was opened to you. The Sixth Seal was opened in 1866. And that is the period that we live in now. And when we come to Malachi chapter 4, we see that the scripture told us that this would happen down in verse 5 when he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, just like it says, Elijah came in 1866 and the great and dreadful day of the Lord was in 1883 and our Messiah returned as the word of God in 1884. He came as the third testament of the Bible, the word of God. Now, let's look at a few more verses from it. Like, for instance, verse 6 out of chapter 53, the time of judgment has arrived. It says, verily I say to you, you are living in the day of the Lord. You are already under his judgment. The living and dead are now being judged. Past and present deeds are being weighed in this scale. Open your eyes so that you can be witness that the divine justice is being felt everywhere. All of humanity has been in judgment since 1866 when the Elijah spirit returned. We still yet live in an age where we can ignore Elijah. And most of the world is doing just that. That all changes with the seventh seal. Well, let's stop down to verse 10, which is talking about all of the devastation that is going on in the world nowadays. We see it all over the news. Verse 10 says, the flood, destruction of the cities by fire, invasions, plagues, sickness, scarcity, and still more ordeals were foretold to all the peoples of humanity so that you would be prepared and not be surprised. In the same way today, the love of God always has sent a message of alertness, of preparation, so that men will awaken, prepare themselves to be strengthened. So don't be fooled thinking that our father somehow wants to restrict certain people from making it into heaven. We are all his children and we will all unite with him one day. But that's not this day. This is the day of the Lord. And that's why we have so much going on. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. We learn here in the Third Testament. 
But let's look at verse 11. It says, I tell you that although it is certain that very great trials await this world, the days of pain shall be shortened. For so great will be their bitterness that they shall cause men to awaken, to turn their eyes to me and to listen to the voice of conscience that urges them to compliance with my law. So here is the time that we're living in, where it's talking about the urging of this voice of the conscience. In other parts of the Third Testament, it's called the vibrating trumpet. We hear over in the book of Matthew how the days of tribulation will be shortened. Well, it hasn't been 200 years since the sixth seal was opened, and we're already talking about the seventh seal. Well, here you learn why it was shortened. Because this pain, these trials, are forcing people to open their eyes and to listen to their conscience. And this voice of the conscious is urging people to compliance with the law. Now, without reading all of the Third Testament to you, let me see if I can make this all make sense. The trials are pushing people to the voice of the conscious. The conscious is urging people to compliance with the law. When people keep the law, their prayers have power. And it is these powerful prayers that are fighting against these wars and natural catastrophes and illnesses that are taking over the world. Back in the engineering world, we used to call this negative feedback. The more we're driven to pray for one another, the faster we will extinguish all evil from the world altogether. But anyway, let's drop down to chapter 55, the purification of the world and humanity and the judgment. We're going to look at verse 5, which says, Blessed are the men, women, and children, who upon realizing the proximity of that justice, glorify my name, sensing that the day of the Lord has arrived, because their heart will tell them that the end of the reign of evil draws near. I say to you that these people, through their faith, their hope, and their good deeds, will be saved. But how many of those who live during those days are going to blaspheme? Talking about those people down in the comment section who, without even bothering to read a word of this scripture, has gone on to question its authority as if they are an authority. And some have even gone on to condemn it altogether. It's easy to understand how that's blasphemy when you remember what John said in chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That what they have condemned was our father. The same word that created our universe simply by speaking it into existence. Verse 2 says the same was in the beginning with God. So we have to be careful and remember what he said about taking into account our faith in his word. Now, besides those who are condemning this word, there will also be those down in the comment section that will say, Nobody knows the day or the hour. A lot of times people take that out of context and use it to say that nobody knows anything as if nobody's reading the Bible. But this is one time when they're right. Matthew chapter 24 and 42 says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Talking about the return of our Messiah. Well, who knew? You see that we are just now learning when our Lord came. And it's been almost 200 years. And those that have studied it the hardest came no closer than 40 years within the date of his true return. So they're right. Nobody would know the day that he would come back. Well, it's past tense now. And far as I remember, hindsight is still 2020. And just to be clear, let's look at the Common English Bible, which says that the Lord is coming. Future tense. So this verse holds true. Nobody could figure out the date that he was coming. But now we see clearly the date that he came. Now, there is one thing we could say about William Miller and all of those various religions that spun off of the Millerites. Every day and from every minister you're hearing and have heard that the day of his wrath is come, is here. Now, all of the scripture we hear about the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And it's not only about great earthquakes and the sun turning black 
from ash clouds of volcanoes. You see in Revelation chapter six and verse 13, it says that the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Well, if you search for astronomical events in 1883, you'll find that not only was there a great comet that passed by on August the 13th of 1883. Now, when we look back over here at this chart from Krakatoa, we see that it stopped to pay attention as there was no activities on the 13th of August. Like we talked about, it was active on the 12th of August. Well, if you look at the astronomical event that occurred on the 12th of August in 1883, what you'll find is the Bonilla observation where Jose saw more than 300 dark unidentified objects crossing before the sun. Sure, many people would have saw this around the world. These dark objects would have been a meteor shower. The thing about Jose is he was actually able to take a picture of it. And from what I understand, this was the first ever picture of such a thing. So unless you are a history buff specializing in astronomical events, this very well could be the earliest meteor shower known to most men. This would be our stars of heaven, which fell to earth, even as a fig tree was cast in front of her untimely figs. One guy saw over 300 meteors, and that's only because he was looking for sunspots at the time. So now that we understand that the day of the Lord has passed, are we to believe that all is well and we can go back to sin? Of course not. Remember Revelation 8 talks about the seventh seal. I'll talk more about that in a future video. So make sure you have that subscribe button pushed and that bell notification button pushed. Else you might not see it. Just like you didn't see this video, we did for the song, Welcome to Midnight, 5,994, written and sung by The Rock Ibar at his channel, The Rock Ibar. He wrote this song based on a calculation that I did, all glory and honor to our Father in heaven, hallowed be his name. And it has been confirmed that we are in the year 5994, understanding that the kingdom of heaven or new Jerusalem is to come down around the year 6001. So the seventh seal is nigh. Again, go ahead and make sure you have that bell notification button pushed. Check out this song and leave us a comment down in the description. It's midnight. Look, 5,994. I tell him board the ark before he locked the door. Light versus darkness, this the final war. It's too late to be playing, our key time is short. If we don't say it, who gon' warn them? Turn it from commandments, that's what scattered us to corners. Everywhere we go. The covenant we made is gon' follow us and it's gon' be a curse if our sins keep piling up. That's facts. The four corners is our address. All over the earth while the land rests. We was worshiping idols, disobeying laws. Just know them same laws gon' break the chains off. So this what we gon' do. Point the people to the shepherd, he gon' heal the nation. Sun, moon, and stars, feast in their proper place. If we follow him, we gon' survive this tribulation. It's a narrow path, everybody ain't gon' make it. I ain't saying I will, I but don't play favorites. No respect to persons, I don't do it. He got several servants. Tell him watch your back, stay on point. These devils lurking, who is that man? Will he hear with a message for the seven churches? Was he the man on the river back in Daniel 12? Nebuchadnezzar threw three men inside the flame. They looked in and saw another man standing there. The Holy One, the seed of David. Break free, flee the matrix, repent and be baptized, I'ma keep it basic, written in stone, they'll never erase it, we that generation. people in that hole.
Messiah is coming. And may our Father bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Father lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.